why do narcissists hate their partners, especially after all the efforts to love bomb? I recently rewatched one of the creepiest movies ever made about narcissistic abuse, and my hands started to shake. The Invisible Man starring Elizabeth Moss tells the story of a woman trying to break free from an abusive relationship with a wealthy optic engineer. I want to warn you, I'm about to do some spoilers of this movie, so if you haven't watched it, you might want to not listen to the rest of this. After making a carefully planned escape from his fortified home, Cecilia, the main character, begins to be tormented by an unseen entity. Adrian, he was a sociopath. He said that I could never leave him. He controlled how I looked and I wore. Then it was controlling when I left the house and eventually what I thought. She knows it's Adrian though, who supposedly is dead because he killed himself after she left. But she knows that it's him because he specializes in stealth technology. This movie takes the audience on a wild ride from Adrian's emotional ambiguity as he switches back and forth between obsessive love and vengeful rage. Adrian wants Cecilia, then he hurts her. He hates her, and then he tries to woo her back. Hi, I'm Dr. Carrie Kerr McAvoy, a mental health clinician and a narcissistic abuse survivor, and this is Toxic Love. If you're interested in learning more about pathological love relationships, please stick around by subscribing to this channel where each week I'm deconstructing a toxic relationship from start to finish. And let me know you're enjoying this video by hitting the like button. So why do narcissists suddenly loathe their partners after going to all the efforts to develop a relationship? In this video, I'm going to explore this puzzling dynamic of devaluation. It's the second of three stages that occur in all narcissistic relationships. Why does it seem to come out of nowhere and is based on nothing? I'm going to reveal the most dangerous part of this weird dynamic at the end of this video, along with what you should do if this happens to you. Sometimes we do this consciously by creating an ideal partner wish list with all the items we want this person to embody, such as their values, their characteristics, interests, and personality traits. And on the first few dates, people that we like or feel some click with benefit from the subconscious desire because whatever we don't know about this person, we fill in with the attributes that we wish for, creating an idealized version of this person. We aren't seeing them for who they really are, but who we wish they'd be. For most of us, this stage is short-lived the more time we spend with a new person. As we get to know their real-life persona, our subconscious assumptions are replaced by facts. For example, we may learn this person isn't going to be our perfect golf partner spending every Saturday out on the course, but we discover that at least they're supportive and then we relinquish that idealized, wished-for trait. Narcissists and other Cluster B personality types, however, approach this process with some game-changing key differences. So let me back up a second and explain something that's pivotal to understand how we search for a romantic partner. We're not basing our hunt just on practical attributes, someone we find physically attractive and who lives a lifestyle similar to us. We're also looking to fill our unconscious needs and insecurities. Say, for example, you had a close relationship with your mother, but she struggled with periodic episodes of depression, causing there to be occasional losses of your usual strong connection. During those periods, she felt remote or distant. Those experiences would have left an unconscious imprint. You're likely to search for someone who rekindles the same positive feelings, yet fear this desired person would ultimately disappoint you, causing a reenactment of the old childhood wound. In other words, our early experiences create a so-called romantic partner template, and we look for someone who matches these unconscious patterns. So how does this work with narcissist and cluster B personalities? Well, exactly the same, except their internal psychological core isn't as stable or strong. So their unconscious imprint is based upon extremely early experiences when our sense of self is still under development and highly volatile. Imagine, for example, telling a hungry eight-year-old as well as a one-year-old that they can't have a cookie because dinner is only 10 minutes away. Both are extremely hungry. 
The eight-year-old wouldn't be happy to hear this, but likely would stop pestering for food after whining a few times because they have the basic understanding of time enough to watch the clock. And they also have learned ways to cope with minor unmet needs. They're likely to start to distract themselves with an activity. The one-year-old, however, doesn't have the same level of maturation or internal structure. They don't have a strong sense of time or haven't learned other effective coping mechanisms. So they're likely to scream and fuss until finally someone puts them in the high chair. These differences continue to exist on an adult scale for narcissists and cluster B personalities. So let's reconsider again how this process of looking for a romantic partner goes. They also have a subconscious wish list of the ideal partner. Only this isn't just wanting a certain look, career, or hobby. If you watched episode eight of Toxic Love called Peeling Back the Good Guy Mask, you'll remember that the narcissist's sense of self is riddled with insecurity and shame. They fear that they're a fraud who might be found out and to avoid detection, they create a false image of the good guy or the wonderful woman. But they're also desperately seeking to fix this insecurity, but go about it in the most unrealistic way. Instead of facing it head on, they search for a perfect partner whose supernatural love is going to cure all that's wrong with them, which they then create as an unconscious fantasy. We see this in the movie, The Invisible Man in the final clip when Adrian and Cecilia meet again for dinner. Uh, uh, my handshake. It's because I need you, Cecilia. I know I didn't treat you the way you should have been treated when we were together. But I've learned my lesson. Adrian admits that he needs her. Remember, this is a man who spent most of the movie torturing her, brutally killing her sister, and nearly destroying everyone who's close to her. He needs her? <laughs> His behavior says he despises her. Adrian doesn't want the real Cecilia, someone who makes mistakes and has interests of her own. He wants the fantasy of Cecilia. Someone who's going to heal all that's wrong with him. Someone who will smooth out all his bad moments, anticipate every one of his whims and please him sexually. Someone who will perfectly meet his needs. That's not the real Cecilia, but rather the imaginary one created by his unconsciousness that acts like the perfect mother, perfect lover, and perfect sociolite. The docile woman who obeys and keeps a spotless house while meeting all of his needs. The Stepford Wives, a science fiction movie that came out in 1975, gives another peek into the same dynamic when a group of discontented rich men swap out their real wives for the perfect robotic version of the same women. When narcissist and cluster B personalities first meet a potential new partner, they create a romanticized image of this individual, something we all do to some extent, but this is done on the epic scale. The love bombing begins to capture this person's attention and the connection that they feel with each other is magnetic, which makes sense considering the potential partner thinks they've met their soulmate, thanks to being mimicked, mirrored, and parroted. They too aren't meeting the real person, but rather a reflection of themselves. However, this is being done to them, not something they're doing to themselves. Unlike the narcissist who creates an idealized version of the person in order to fill their own unconscious fantasy. Of course, once real life sets in, the spell is broken. What may have seemed like an ordinary moment to the new person or to you wasn't to the narcissist. Once real life intrudes, the imaginary bubble of having the perfect life bursts and it doesn't take much, probably something you weren't even aware of. Like maybe your plans didn't line up quite right or you laughed too loud or too long. Something you did activated one of their insecurities Perhaps you had your first fight, but you revealed in that moment to them that you are not the perfect person they imagined. And suddenly, like a light switch, your image shifts and the rosy glow is gone and you're never viewed the same. For the narcissist, the love they felt for you evaporates, replaced with anger, frustration, and even hatred. We see this shift in Adrian when his brother explains he needs you because you don't need him. No one's ever left him before, but he's punished you enough now, now that he knows that you're the mother of his child. It's time to stop playing games. A new life with him could be given to you with one phone call, a life just like your old one with Adrian. Cecilia, you really don't have a choice right now. He was always going to find you, no matter what he had to do. 
He needs you because you don't need him. No one's ever left him before, but he's punished you enough now. But why does Adrian feel so much rage? Think back to that hungry one-year-old who can't have a cookie. When a narcissist loses the idealized version of the person who is supposed to fix everything wrong with them in their life, they mentally turn that person into a demon, someone who's now responsible for ruining their hopes. Your perceived failure to be their magical solution kicks off an outer proportion rage, and they become the emotional equivalent of a toddler having a tantrum in an adult body. In their mind, your failure to live up to that idealized fantasy of being a savior is as if you betrayed them. And this wound in their minds justifies the right to harm you. To someone rational, none of this makes sense. That's because the volatile flipping from loving to loathing is rooted in primal survival instincts, a part of us that gets overridden with maturation and better coping mechanisms. Time and growth teaches us that nothing in life is ideal and everything is a mix of good and bad, black and white. So if you see your narcissistic partner shift from idealization to devaluation, don't try to explain it away to them or to yourself or to justify it because you're putting yourself at risk by downplaying the potential dangerousness. And if you're ever cornered by a raging person, please do the following. First, communicate to them in a quiet voice and use non-threatening gestures. Second, go along with them, even if it means game playing until you can make your escape. Number three, be careful not to lie because they're hypervigilant and great at detecting deception. Number four, stick to the simple truth without offering too many details. And number five, Stay away from any hot buttons in your relationship with them, which is likely to inflame the situation. That should be addressed at another time when they're more rational. Obviously, it's best to avoid getting in a relationship with someone like this, but here's a simple way to identify someone when you first meet them. And I learned this from a graduate school mentor when I was going through the doctoral training. Watch out for anyone who's overly flattering or extremely charming. If this person sees you in a psychologically larger than life way or puts you on some kind of a pedestal, that's a sign of excessive idealization. Remember, the higher you rise, the greater you're gonna fall. Or as my mentor put it, Watch out when we're treated like a nugget of gold because next, this person's going to see us as a piece of shit. Has this video been helpful in understanding why narcissists and other toxic people flip from loving to hating us? If so, be sure to like it and stick around by subscribing to this channel. And if you like this episode, then be sure to check out last week's when I explained why narcissists hate it when we cry. And you're not going to want to miss next week's when I reveal the reason why narcissists use breadcrumbing to keep us in a relationship, even when they no longer like or love us. Hey, big hugs and stay strong and safe.